Hey folks, today's topic is functions part one. We're going to do functions again next time. So this is just kind of introducing the idea of what a function is. So our learning target is to be able to identify um, a function, whether or not we call these a relation. Relations are uh, any relationship. Um, specific relations become these things called functions. And our goal today is be able to identify which relations are actually functions. And we know we'll be successful at this if um, if you can apply the definition of a function to your criteria of determining whether something's a function or not, if a relation is a function or not. So let's start with that definition. So definition, a function. Underline function, that's the word we're defining. A function from a set. And we usually use capital letters to indicate sets. A function from a set A to a set B is a relation that assigns to each element x in set A exactly one element y in set B. So this is math speak. You know, mathematicians, we like to be very precise, but sometimes our precision makes it hard to understand what we're even talking about. So let's kind of break this down. So like I said, a relation is any relationship between two things. To make a relation into a function, we have to have this characteristic, that everything, every element in A, we call the elements in set A X, they go to exactly one element y in set b so another way that we could say this and probably the way that i would recommend remembering it for every x there is exactly one y Notice what I didn't say. I didn't say for every x there's a y. That is not strong enough. You have to say for every x there's exactly one y. And I'm going to get into what that looks like over here in a minute. Um, just a reminder, you probably remember this, I bet, from middle school, is when we're, to, when we're talking about x's and y's, the x values belong to a group called the domain. And the y values belong to a group called the range. So let's say that this is set A. I don't know what it is. It could be whatever we want. I'm going to make it numbers, but you could make it a set of, you know, clothing. You can make it food. You can make set B something related or not related. You could have clothing over here and books over here. But what we're trying to talk about is the relationship to each other. And you can set up any relationship that you want, but... For that relationship to be a function, it has to follow this rule for every x, there's exactly one y. So this is our function machine. I'm going to pick some random numbers, and I'm going to put them into our function machine. So let's say I pick the number negative 4, 5, negative 2, 7. Let's say there's lots and lots of other numbers in there, but I don't want to write them all down. And then over in this one, we've got, uh, let's say, negative 1. 8, 11, 0, let's pick a little bit, let's pick a fun one, pi, you know, it's just a bunch of numbers. So, the function is what relates the first set to the next, to the other set. So let's say, when I put negative 4 into the function machine, it comes out as 11. So negative 4 relates to 11. And let's say 5, when I put it in, 
comes out as negative one. I mean, you could think about this. Let's say that there was a squared. Our function was the squared function. That would mean negative four would go to 16 and five would go to 25. I just kind of picked random numbers here. Let's say when I plug in negative two, I get out the pi. When I plug in seven, I get out eight. Okay, so these are all the relationships. Is this a function? Yes. Yes, this is a function. Because for every x, there's exactly one y. So when I put in negative 4, I get out 11. When I put in 5, I get out negative 1. When I put in negative 2, I get out pi. When I put in 7, I get out 8. That's okay. Look, and, and 0 doesn't have anybody matched to it. That's okay too. The rule is for every x, there's only one y. So let's say, let's look at a situation where this doesn't come out so nice. So I'm going to pick another uh, set A. This is going to be the 2, the set of 2, 11, negative 6, 5, and 4. Then over here, we've got 8, and I don't know, square root 2, uh, 3 fourths, negative uh, 7. Okay, so this time our function 2 maps to root 2. 11 maps to negative 7. Negative 6 maps to 8. 5 maps to root 2. Now let's stop and talk about that before we go any further. I'm going to go back up here. I'm going to add a new element. I'm going to add and set A the element 3. And 3 also maps to negative 1. Is this still a function? Yes. This is okay. This is okay. Because remember, the rule is for every x, there's exactly one y. So this one x goes to negative 1, and this one x goes also to negative 1. But does this x have only one output? Yes. Does this x have only one output? Yes. Now down here, we're in this same boat. 5 goes to root 2, and so does 2. That's okay. They're allowed to both go to them. What's bad is this scenario. Let's take 4 and map it to the 3 fourths. And 4 also maps to negative 7. This is what's bad. So this... Let me get a different color. This is a function. Ugh. This is not a function. So that one is not a function because of this scenario right here. This guy messes this one up. This 4 goes to root to 3 fourths, and this 4 also goes to negative 7. So when we were interviewing for Mr. Wojo's job, um, one of the guys that w was interviewing, I thought, explained this really well. I mean, he's not as good a teacher as Mr. Wojo. Obviously, that's why we kept Wojo. But I thought he explained this idea really well. He said, think about a function as a vending machine. So you go to a vending machine, and let's pretend like this vending machine for some reason has a fogged up glass window. So you can't see what's inside. You know that there's candy in there. You just don't know what, what kind of candy. So you go to the vending machine. You push. You put in your dollar. You put A3, and Snickers falls down. Okay, great. Well, what happens if you come the next day and you hit A4? What if Snickers comes down? To you? That's okay, right? You can have two different inputs have the same output. A4 and A3 both got you Snickers. Those were the inputs. They got you the same output. That's okay. I mean, the whole thing could be full of Snickers. That doesn't violate the rules of a function. The problem is if you go to A3 and you hit and Snickers comes out, then the next day you come back and hit A3 again and you get Skittles, that's the problem. That's when it's not a function because your input of A3 Gave you Snickers the first time, and it gave you Skittles the next time. That's a problem. That's what makes it not a function. I mean, imagine your calculator. What if you typed into your calculator 3 plus 5 and got 8 the first time, and then you typed in 3 plus 5 and got 11 the next time? 
I mean, that's a problem. And that's why we care about functions. So hopefully that makes sense on what a function is. So let's look at a couple of examples and determine if they're functions. So do the following relations represent a function? So remember, our argument is totally is, is this. For every x, is there exactly one y? So this 1x of negative 1 only goes to 7. 4 goes to 1. 5 goes to 7. 4 goes to negative. Oh, that's a problem. 4 goes to 1 and 4 goes to negative 2. That is a problem. So we would then say no. Remember the question is, does this represent a function? When you say no, you have to make an argument. No, because who's the problem? 4. And the way we say this is we say 4 maps to 1 and negative 2. Now, if you were to say 4 goes to 1 and negative 2, that'd be fine. It's not quite as mathematical, but it, it, would, be, it would be legal. All right, let's look at the next one. Is this a function? Negative 2 goes to 3. Negative 1 goes to 0. 0 goes to 1. Okay, this is kind of confusing. So there's only one x of 0. So that doesn't repeat. That's good. Negative 2 goes to 3. But 2 goes to 3, but those are different x's. They can have the same y's. Different x's can have the same y's. Now, this is interesting. We've got a negative 1 that goes to 0, and we've got another negative 1. But where does it go? It goes to 0 again. So, yes, this is a function. Even though there's two negative 1s, they both map to the same output. So our argument is this right here. You can't just say yes or no. You must, make it a, a, you must justify your result. Yes. And I always say it the same way. For every x, there is exactly one y. And then the last situation uh, when it comes to determining whether something is a function or not is graphically. These are super easy to figure out. You might already even remember it from geometry or algebra one. So I'm going to make the argument that if I draw a vertical line and that vertical line hits two points on the curve, then you don't have a function. And that should make sense considering what we know about a function. Remember, what makes it a function is whether or not for every x there's exactly one y. So as I look at this picture, this 1x, whatever that number is, has a y value up here. This is a y value. And then this is a different y value for that one x value. That's a problem. Because when I put in x into this function, sometimes I get this y value out. Sometimes I get this other y value out. We can't have that. So we would say, no, this is not a function. And graphically, the easy you could still say this. That would be fine. Like you would say, uh, 1x maps to more than 1y. You could say it like that. But when it comes graphically, the easiest thing to say is f, which is the name of your function. No, f fails the VLT, where VLT stands for vertical line test. So that's what this test is. If you can draw a vertical line anywhere, it doesn't have to be correct every time. If you can find one place that's wrong, your function is not a function. Sorry, your relation is not a function. If you can draw a vertical line anywhere and it hits the graph twice, then you're, you don't have a function. All right, this last spot, this, uh, it's not really a function as much as function notation. So I figure this is a nice spot to talk about this. So let's talk about this notation. This is read f of x, not f times x. Normally, the parentheses mean multiply. In this case, that is not true. This is the name of the function dependent on this is the variable, the independent variable. So whatever x is over here, that's going to tell you what the overall function value is. So sometimes we call this g of x or h of x or k of x or m of x or p of x or v of x. I mean, there's all sorts of different ways we could name this. 99% of the time, I'm going to call it f of x. f is the name of the function. x is the independent variable. So when I change f of x and make it f of 5, I mean, what's different? 
Well, the X is gone and a five is in its place. So what do you think is going to happen to these X's over here? I'm going to put the five in its place. We call this plugging in. So you've done this a million times, but I'm going to now plug in. Everywhere there was an X, I'm going to put a five in there. So this would be 10, subtract three times five, subtract 14 times five squared, which then we would write now our full answer as F of five equals, grab your calc or do it in your head, that's 25, uh, negative 355. So I'm going to encourage you to try to do f of 2 on your own. All righty, let's see how you did. So f of 2 would equal 10, subtract 3 times negative 2, subtract 14 times negative 2 squared. Notice that I used my parentheses. Anytime there was a variable up here, I didn't really need to because that five was positive, so you could get away without it. But I always I get in the habit of always drawing parentheses wherever there's a variable so that I don't ever make that mistake. And then this turns out to be negative 40. I'm going to check those. I had them in my notes. I think I'm right. I'm all of a sudden not sure. First one's good. Yeah. All right. They're both good. So how does this change when we don't have a simple number in there, but we have another equation, another function? It's fine. We just take out the x and replace it with this other function, this 2x minus 3. So what would that look like? 10, subtract 3, and now I'm taking out the x, and I'm replacing it with what we put in for x. So 2x minus 3 goes wherever there's x. Subtract 14. There's another x, so I'm going to put in 2x minus 3, then I'm going to square it. Now I need to clean this up. A couple of things that I want to write a little note about. I'm going to go to the bottom here. I don't know how, how to remind you of this and just make it... I mean, it's just something that you've got to, got to, got to, got to, got to, got to know. This is not true. This does not turn out to be 4x squared. I will write it like this. This does not turn out to be 2x squared minus 3 squared. We don't distribute the exponent. I mean, you could, I could quickly prove this to you with a simple example. I mean, let's just pick something real easy. Let's just do uh, 2 plus 3 squared. Is that the same as 2 squared? plus 3 squared. So 2 plus 3 is 5. 5 squared is 25. Does that equal 4 plus 9? No. 4 plus 9 is 13. This is simply not true. So then how do we handle 2x minus 3 squared? We have to write it twice. We have to exp what's called expand it. So that's going to look something like this. Um, I'm going to use an orange. So that's going to look like this. 2x minus 3 squared is equal to 2x minus 3 times 2x minus 3. Remember, anything squared just means that times itself. So like 6 squared means 6 times 6. Now I would start to distribute this. 2x times 2x is 4x squared. 2x times negative 3 is negative 6x. Negative 3 times 2x is negative 6x. Negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. Then we would combine like terms. That is an expanded version of this. So now I'm going to go back up here. And I have, I'm going to give myself a little bit more room. 10, subtract 3 times the quantity 2x minus 3. 
Subtract 14 times the quantity, and now I can put this in its place. 4x squared, subtract 12x plus 9. Now I can get rid of the parentheses. I, yeah, distribute the negative 3, that's negative 6x plus 9. Distribute the negative 14, that's negative 56. X squared plus 168X. Subtract 126. And then finally, I'm going to combine all my like terms, and I'm going to put it in standard form. I'm going to put the x squared first. So I've got negative 56 x squared. I've got 168 take away 6, which would be 162. And then 10 plus 9 is 19. Take away would be, let me double check that one. 10 plus 9 minus 126, negative 107. Okay, so we talked about what is a function. So we spent some time there. Hopefully your big takeaway was for every x, there's exactly one y. And then we talked about function notation. And that's the idea that I could take out x and I could replace it with either a number, a constant, or I could replace it with another function and then clean up from there. Go get them.